The text this morning is from Acts chapter 1, verse 1. These are the words of God. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Gracious God and Father, we thank you for the presence of your spirit here today. We thank you for how he has given us to one another. We thank you for how you've given all of us your word. And I pray your Holy Spirit would be active today, applying your word to our lives, our hearts, our families, everything that needs that application. Father, we pray in the strong name of Jesus, and amen. amen. So we are beginning a series today through the Acts of the Apostles, and from time to time I'm going to use an alternative name for it. I'll be calling it the Adventures of the Apostles. Um, this, is not a, uh, this is not a book that drags. We're dealing with a book that has shipwrecks and courtroom drama and snake bites and uh, people, dro uh, people dropping dead at the offertory. Um, it's an exciting book. And we have to understand how to place this book as we're, as we're thinking about it, meditating on it. If we understand the structure that God has um, used to give us this book, we're going to be in a better position to appreciate just how thrilling and exciting this book is. Now, the longest book in the New Testament is the Gospel of Luke. The second longest is volume two of this same set, the Acts of the Apostles, the book, the book where we're going to be spending some time. These two books were written by the same man and were dedicated to the same man, someone named Theophilus. While we are beginning to work through this book, it's important to remember that we keep this book connected in our minds and our hearts with what Luke has recorded about the Lord's ministry earlier. And this first message is going to focus on that, which is why the text is just the first verse, which is not even a complete sentence. So we're just, uh, just introducing the book, and I want to spend our time connecting the Gospel of Luke to the book of Acts. And then later, we're going to start working through Acts systematically. Luke begins the book of Acts by making explicit reference to the gospel of Luke. It's clear that he, the author, sees them as a matching set. He's presenting them as a matching set. He is addressing this treatise, and the word is logos, to Theophilus, the same man who was addressed in the account given in the gospel of Luke. He then says that the first account was concerning all that Jesus began to do and teach. And I want to emphasize that word began because the implication is that this book, the book of Acts, will be an account of what Jesus will continue to do and teach. What Jesus began to do and teach is in the Gospel of Luke, and what he will continue to do and teach is found in the book of Acts. So clearly, this is going to be done through the expansion of his body, the church. So what happens is the Lord Jesus is incarnate, and we see his incarnate ministry through the Gospel of Luke. In the first part of Acts, in the first chapter of Acts, the Lord Jesus ascends into heaven. And then in Acts chapter 2, he pours out his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit creates and shapes and forms the Christian church, which is the body of Christ. And this is how Christ continues to work in the world. So this is going to be accomplished because the Spirit of Christ will be poured out at the very beginning of this book. And as we're going to see, so the Lord will continue to his teaching and his deeds through his appointed and his anointed servants. That's um, verse 1. Christ indwells believers, and this means that these believers are his hands and feet. We are his hands and feet out in the world. Jesus continues, Jesus therefore continues his ministry through his body. Christ, who is the hope of glory, is in us, as we're told in Colossians 1.27. Christ is in us. Christ is being formed in us, as we're told in Galatians 4.19. And this, in turn, has an impact on the world because we are in the world. Christ is in heaven, but he poured out his spirit. His spirit is in us, and we are in the world. Therefore, Christ remains in the world. Christ is working in the world. Christ is accomplishing great deeds in the world. He is doing it through the agency of his body. Who was this Luke? How do we, where's this coming from? The author of the third gospel, 
and of our only inspired account of the early church, is a bit of a mystery figure. Not entirely a mystery figure, but he's a bit of a mystery figure to us. We are introduced to him obliquely in Acts 16. Luke doesn't uh, give us a great fanfare about it, but it's pretty clear that this is our introduction to the author. In Luke, in, in Acts 16, 8, the account says that they came to Troas. So up to 16, 8, the account that is being given of Paul is a third person account. They did this, they did that, they did the other thing. The last thing that they did was they came to Troas. When they came to Troas, in the next verse, in verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. So in Acts 16, 9, Paul has a vision during the night where a man of Macedonia asks for help. Now, incidentally, this is the first missionary foray into Europe because the um, they were in Asia Minor, and in Macedonia is in northern Greece, which is in Europe. So the first foray of the gospel that is recorded is here in Acts 16. So this man of Macedonia appears. In the next verse, in verse 10, it says that immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia. So between verse 8 and verse 10, Luke joins them. So they came to Troas, Paul has a vision, man of Macedonia asks for help, the Macedonian call, and then it says, we left to go to Macedonia. So this is the place where Luke teamed up with Paul. It's part of the, it's one of the we passages, and it seems related to the vision somehow. If Luke is the man in the vision, this lends support to the long tradition that Luke was a Gentile, and I, th- I think that it's not a crazy idea to assume that Luke may have been the man in the vision. So how would you put all this together? Paul has a vision. A man from Macedonia says, come and help us. And then in the morning, uh, Luke shows up at the front door and says, I was wondering if you could come over to Macedonia and help us. And they put two and two together. Maybe God's telling us to go to Macedonia. Well, they put the two and two together somehow, and Luke joins up with them somehow, and it's related to the vision somehow. We don't know exactly how it happened, but Luke is in involved in this, in, in, Luke shows up in this intersection. And this, the long tradition that Luke was a Gentile is a reasonable tradition. This, this would make him a man of Macedonia, northern Greece. And in support of this, uh, the Greek uh, that Luke and Acts is written in is the most polished and sophisticated of all the Greek in the New Testament. So Luke is an urbane writer. He's a sophisticated writer. So this is written by an educated man who knew Greek well. We also know, with many points of confirmation, that he was a first-class historian on top of everything else. So he tells us in the gospel that he he, uh, wrote this account after talking to many eyewitnesses. He is a first-class historian. He has a precise turn of mind. He has a precise turn of mind. He and and the various claims he've he's made have been vindicated again and again. Uh, here's one example of the precision of his mind. The other, and this is not a matter of the other gospels being inaccurate, but just simply not as precise. So, for example, the other gospels call Herod a king. So, King Herod. We refer to Herod as a king. Luke refers him by the more technically precise term of tetrarch. Technically, that's what Herod was, a tetrarch, but he functioned as a king. He was popularly known as a king. It's not not an error to call him a king, but Luke is precise. Luke calls him a tetrarch. We also know that he was a medical doctor because of a passing remark that Paul makes in Colossians. He says in Colossians 4.14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So Luke is a beloved member of Paul's entourage, and it says he's a medical doctor. He's a, a physician. He's one, so he's clearly one of those guys. He's a historian, carefully minded, urbane writer, sophisticated writer, medical doctor, one of those guys. Not only was Luke a faithful member of Paul's entourage, he remained so until the end of Paul's life. In 2 Timothy 4.11 
where Paul is, Paul is coming into the backstretch. He's rounding into the straight. He has finished the fight. He's, he's completed the race. He's right near the end of his life. And he says, only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. So Luke was with Paul to the end of Paul's life. Luke is mentioned only one other time in the conclusion of Philemon in verse 24. So this man, about whom we don't know a lot, we know bits and pieces, physician, historian, uh, good writer. We know those sorts of things about him. We know that he was a faithful character. This man had a profound impact on the character of the church because he wrote the first account of the church in its liftoff stage, and that sort of gave us the template for how this is supposed to go. His gospel, uh, another detail that should be uh, mentioned, is Luke's gospel pays close attention to the Gentiles, as well as to those who are suffering in various ways, or people who were oppressed in various ways. The close attention he pays to Gentiles is consistent with him being a Gentile, and the way he pays attention to the oppressed or the suffering is consistent with him being a medical doctor with a precise eye. So for example, one gospel will say that this man had leprosy. Uh, Luke will say his body was filled with leprosy. His body was filled with leprosy, indicating uh, more of a connection or more sympathy or connection with the person who is suffering in that way. So Luke's urbanity, his careful scholarship, his compassion have helped set the tone for countless numbers of believers throughout the history of the church. This is the pattern. This is the template for what the activity of Jesus should look like while, while it is driving and shaping the lives of imperfect and fallen and forgiven human beings. This is the, this is the pattern. This is what we should look, this is what we should be looking at as we compare how we're doing with how we ought to be doing. So with addressing who Luke was, here's another question. Who was Theophilus? Who was Theophilus? And suggestion, we, of course, we can't prove conclusively, but, and so consequently different suggestions have been made regarding the identity of Theophilus. Was he an unbelieving seeker, for example, that Luke was wanting to evangelize? Was Theophilus Luke's next door neighbor? And he one day said, Luke, tell me about this Christianity of yours. And Luke knew that he was a careful student. And so he wanted to write an exhaustive account. And he was evangelizing someone that he knew, an unbeliever named Theophilus. Or possibly, was he a patron who financially backed Luke's research? Um, the production of uh, books in the New Testament era was an expensive endeavor. Even a short epistle was something was a, a venture that would cost thousands of dollars in in today's terms because everything had to be done by hand. You usually had to hire a uh, a scribe who would uh, make the transcription for you. You had to usually you, you would make a copy so that you would have uh, mailing things or sending things where it's not a secure. Um, Venture, And so you had to, so even short epistles were very, very expensive. Something like uh, Luke and Acts, something like that research project would be really, really expensive. So the idea was Theophilus, the patron, who made it possible for Luke to go interview all the people he interviewed for the gospel and to do the careful accounting. And, and was, that, was that who Theophilus was? Who was he? Well, in my view, the most likely candidate is a man named Theophilus ben Ananus. Theophilus ben Ananus, who was the high priest of the Jews from 37 AD to 41 AD, a four-year period, and it would be very early on, 37 AD to 41 AD. And the high priest in that time period was named, was in fact named Theophilus. This would make him the son of Annas, um, Luke 3, 2, and brother-in-law of Caiaphas, Matthew 26, 3. You remember Caiaphas is the one who was presiding over the trial when Jesus was condemned. Caiaphas is the one who tore his robes. You've heard the blasphemy. What further need of witnesses do we have? So if this is the, if this is the Theophilus that I think it is, then he was the brother-in-law to Caiaphas and the son of Annas, who was also up to no good in that, uh, in that situation. 
Now, in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, the honorific, most excellent, is attached. Most, most excellent Theophilus, indicating that he was a, a, a significant uh, figure of some sort. This identification, and it's important to note, this identification does not make Theophilus a friendly reader, as though the son of the corrupt Annas was about to become a Christian. Now, that's not impossible. So, for example, when, when the Apostle Paul appears before Agrippa and Bernice, he, and Agrippa says, almost you persuade me to become a Christian. Paul says, well, I, I'm not against that. You know, if, if, uh, I, I wish that everybody could become like I am, except for these chains. So Paul is more than happy to give testimony to kings and all those in authority. Uh, so it's not out of the question for a ruler to be converted. So I'm not arguing that Luke was writing Theophilus off, but Either way you go, whether he was assume, whether he was trying to reach Theophilus personally, um, Theophilus was certainly a player, and so it makes sense that such a dedication would be attached to these two great apologetic works. Luke is a, is an apologetic work, and Acts is an apologetic work. Think of it like John Calvin dedicating his Institutes of the Christian Religion to King Francis I, a Catholic monarch who is decidedly unsympathetic to the Reformation. So Calvin's a reformer. Calvin is fully in the Reformed camp, and, and he writes the sort of the, the textbook, the, the go-to book for the entire Reformation, and he dedicates it to a Catholic. He dedicates it to king, the King of France, who was not friendly at all. Well, it, it's an apologetic work. I'm, I'm setting before you, you who are in a position to persecute my people, I want you to know who we really are. I want you to know what's really going on. And I think that that's what Luke was doing in the Gospel of Luke and in the Acts of the Apostles. How would someone write for uh, a, a hostile authority? How would someone write an account for someone who was biased and prejudiced against you and who was in a position to do you harm. In such a scenario, the two great questions would be, who was this Jesus? And who are these Christians? Who was this Jesus? And who are these Christians? Remember, and, th and this is, um, you're, you're writing for someone, if this supposition is correct, you're writing for someone who has all sorts of reasons to be conflicted about this, right? Because what the account that's given is an account of how the Jewish authorities treated the Messiah of God when the promised one arrived. Right? Th that's the scenario. And so it would be your dad, your father did this, and your brother-in-law did this, and you may well have been in the room. You may well have been in the room and likely were in the room. But there's another side to that. Who are the first, who are the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus? The guards. The guards were the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who is the second group to know about it? Well, the people who bribed the guards to lie about it. The authorities, the religious authorities said, just say his disciples stole the body and we'll hush it up if the word comes to the the word comes to your boss, we'll hush it up. Now, when the decision was made to bribe the guards to lie about the resurrection of Jesus, Theophilus could have been there. All right, so this is something that it's not out of the question for Luke to be making an appeal to this man. The third group of people to know about the resurrection were the women who came to the tomb, and the fourth group were the disciples. So the guards, the bad guys, the women, and then the disciples. So when you're laying out the case for how all these things happened, Luke, a careful writer, is going to write a book, I think, to someone who matters, to someone who's thinking about all of this is important to take into account. And in the book of Acts, you see that Luke is very careful to note how Paul does in his interactions with Festus and with Felix and with King Agrippa. He, he, he's, he's noting these things for the record. I want you to know for the record what exactly happened. For the record, who was this Jesus? For the record, who are these Christians? So is Luke, how intentional is Luke about having us see 
the gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, the adventures of the Apostles, side by side. These books were not composed in some slapdash way. We are invited, and we are invited by Luke, to read this two-volume set side by side, both of them together. And I want to walk through some parallels between Luke and Acts. And these parallels were gathered by a scholar named Mark Powell. Mark Powell. And one of them, or one or two of them, are not all that remarkable. But when you take all of them together, it is very clear that this was not an accident. Very clear. So Luke and Acts, parallel columns. Luke is addressed to Theophilus. Luke 1, 1 through 4. Acts 1, 1 through 5, addressed to Theophilus. So one is addressed to Theophilus, and so is the other one. The Spirit descends on Jesus while he is praying. Luke 3, 21 and 22. The Spirit descends on the disciples as they were praying. Acts 2, 1 through 13. A sermon announce, announces prophecy fulfilled. Luke 4, 16 through 27. A sermon announces prophecy fulfilled. Acts 2, 14 through 40. Jesus heals a cripple. Luke 5, 17 through 26. Peter heals a cripple. Acts 3, 1 through 10. Religious authorities attack Jesus. Luke 5, 29 through 6, 11. Religious authorities attack the apostles. Acts 4, 1 through 8, 3. A centurion invites Jesus to his house. Luke 7, 1 through 10. A centurion invites Peter to his house. Acts 10, 1 through 23. Jesus raises a widow's son from the dead. Luke 7, 11 through 17. Peter raises a widow from the dead. Acts 9, 36 through 43. A missionary trip to the Gentiles occurs in Luke 10, 1 through 12. And then a missionary there's missionary trips to the Gentiles, Acts 13, 1 through 19, 20. A big section of the book of Acts there. But mission to the Gentiles. Mission to the Gentiles in Luke. Mission to the Gentiles in Acts. Jesus goes to Jerusalem, Luke 9, 51 through 19, 28. Paul goes to Jerusalem, Acts, uh, Acts 19, 21 through 21, 17. Jesus is received in Jerusalem favorably. Luke 19, 37. That's the triumphal entry. Paul is received in Jerusalem favorably. Acts 21, 17 through 20. Jesus was devoted to the temple. Luke 19, 45 through 48. Paul was devoted to the temple. Acts 21, 26. Sadducees oppose Jesus and scribes support him. Luke 20, 27 through 39. Sadducees oppose Paul and Pharisees support him. Acts 23, 6 through 9. That was the point where Paul says, I'm a Pharisee and I'm on trial here for the resurrection of the dead. And then quarreling broke out in the Sanhedrin. Jesus breaks bread, giving thanks. Luke 22, 19. Paul breaks bread, giving thanks. Acts 27, 35. Jesus is seized by a mob. Luke 22, 54. Paul is seized by a mob. Acts 21, 30. Jesus is slapped by the high priest's aides. Luke 22, 63 and 64. Paul is slapped by order of the high priest. Acts 23, 2. Jesus is tried four times and is declared innocent three times. Jesus is tried four times and declared innocent three times. Luke 22, 66 through 23, 13. Paul is tried four times and declared innocent three times. Acts 23, 1 through 26, 32. Jesus is rejected by the Jews. Luke 23, 18. Paul is rejected by the Jews. Acts 21, 36. Jesus is regarded favorably by a centurion, Luke 23, 47. Paul is regarded favorably by a centurion, Acts 27, 43. Final confirmation of fulfilled scripture, Luke 24, 45 through 47. And final confirmation of fulfilled scripture, Acts 28, 23 through 28. Now I would submit to you that either Luke was doing this on purpose or he was the luckiest writer in the world. This was not luck. This was not luck. This was Luke thinking it through. Luke was, Luke was seeking to communicate something about the nature of the Lord's ministry and about the nature of the church's ministry in the world. 
So when, as we reflect on what Jesus did during his earthly ministry, and as we study how he worked in the first century through those who had believed in him, what Jesus did in his own body, and what Jesus did in his body, the church, we are going to learn a great deal about how to read the narrative that is unfolding all around us now. We're going to be able to read, as you've heard me say a number of times, you're going to have to learn how to read the story you're in. How do you read the story you're in? Everybody is in a story. All of us are in a story. We live in time. There's a narrative arc to everything that's going on. And you cannot understand yourself by freeze-framing anything. You can't just take a, a screenshot of your heart and then hold it up and look at it and say, I'm, this is how I'm going to evaluate how I'm doing. This is, we want to stand in front of the mirror, just freeze the moment and say, this is what I'm like. This is how I'm doing. This is my, this is my sterling character. Because all of us want to be the good guy. All of us want to be justified. All of us justify ourselves in our own minds. <coughs> so here's the challenge. Here's the problem. In order to understand yourself, in order to understand who you are, you have to understand yourself in the narrative. You have to understand yourself in the story. You have to see the arc. And absolutely everybody in the world is telling themselves a story, and that story has, that they, they themselves are the protagonist of the story. They can't walk down the street without being the protagonist in the story. And if they've got earbuds in, they maybe have the soundtrack going for the movie that they are starring in. And they, they check themselves out in the, st in the shop windows. And they, this is who I am. And this is, why, this is why I'm doing all these things. Well, everybody does that. Mediocre people do that. Good guys do it. Bad guys do it. Everybody does it. Everybody thinks they're the hero. Everybody thinks that they're the protagonist. And a bunch of them aren't. A bunch of them aren't. There will be people the last day who come to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these marvelous things? I could, I could tell you about how the, the story about when I did this and the story about when I did that. And the Lord is going to say, depart from me, you wor workers of iniquity, I never knew you. In other words, there are some people, self-appointed protagonists, who are in for a rude shock. They're in for a rude awakening because they thought they were the protagonist and they were the antagonist. They thought they were the good guy. They were the bad guy. So it doesn't matter how sincere Caiaphas may have felt at the moment when he tore his robe and said, this is blasphemy. We don't measure things by individual sincerity. We measure them against the word of God. And this is how we tell who we are in the story. God has given us a template. God has given us something to look at. And we have to look at the template of the book of Acts, and we have to look at what is described there, and we have to read it humbly, Putting, laying down, setting down the possibility that we might be the problem. Because God's a masterful storyteller, right? He's a masterful storyteller. And one of the things that masterful storytellers do is they give you plot twists, things you didn't see coming. Every, and, and then after you, it, it erupts in the story, you realize, oh, I should have seen that coming, but I didn't see that coming. And it surprised me. It completely surprised me. But now that I'm reading this book for the second time, which is what happens when you are really gratified by a plot twist, you read it again and you start noticing all the tells that were planted there by the author. And then, oh, now, now this plot twist that makes sense. This makes complete sense now. Budget for the possibility that if you do some serious self-examination, if you do some serious self-reflection, budget for the plot twists. But don't just, uh, the problem here is if I say just budget for the possibility, the prospect that you might be the bad guy, there's going to be sensitive types who take a screenshot of that and they're just going to assume that they're the bad guy. And this is not humility, it's relativism. Uh, someone has defined a liberal as someone who is incapable of taking his own side in an argument. Uh, the, pur the purpose of an open mind, Chesterton says, is the same thing as the purpose of an open mouth. It's meant to close on something. You are supposed to come to a conclusion. But the thing that you are advocating for, the thing that you're to be hungry for, the thing that you're to be in pursuit of is the truth and not a self-serving narrative. In other words, you, what you want is the truth. What is the truth? 
What's the truth about me? What's the truth about God? What's the truth about the church I belong to? What is the truth? Not what would flatter me. And so if you lay down every, uh, I'm not going to hang on to uh, the, the things that will flatter me. I'm going to put it all down on the table and I'm going to read the book of Acts. And I'm going to read the book of Acts as an individual. And I'm going to read the book of Acts as a member of a congregation. And I want God to lead me into the truth. I want to learn how to see the back of my own head. I want to, I want to, I want to know. I want to know the way it is, not the way I would like it to be, but the way it actually is. There are people who are convinced that the rest of the army is out of step. Right? I'm, I'm in step. I'm doing the thing I ought to do. The rest of the army is out of step. And everybody, everybody who knows them knows that they are the problem. They're being, you know, it, it's the old uh, uh, conjugation. I am uh, strong-willed. You are obstinate. He is pig-headed. Uh, that's we we tell the narrative in the in the in a self-serving way this is the antidote the antidote is to to use scripture as a mirror as the bible tells us it is but without a priori commitments to your own self-justification in other words set it all down set everything completely down what did ananias and sapphira think they were doing and what were they doing? What Demas mentioned earlier, what was he doing? What, what did he think he was doing? What was Judas doing? What did he think he was doing? Everybody thinks they're doing, every, everybody thinks of themselves in ways that are a little bit inflated. So what we want to do is we don't want to abandon everything and plunge into an abyss of despair and relativism. We want to know the truth. And if you want to know the truth, then this has to be your guide. The Word of God has to be your guide. So what does it mean for fallen but forgiven sinners to walk in the footsteps of Jesus? What does it mean? What does it mean for Christ to work through his body? We have a template set out for us here, enabling us to look to Christ effectively. How do, what does it look like when we look to Christ? When you are instructed in a sermon to look to Christ, and you frequently are, especially at the conclusion of sermons, instructed, exhorted to look to Christ, and you say to yourself, I think I did, I think I'm looking to Christ, but how can I know? That, that question, how can I know, remains. How can I know, remains. We are to judge, the Bible teaches us, not by gifts, but by fruit. There are miracles in the book of Acts, and we don't, we don't do miracles here. That's not what we're looking at. We're not looking at gifts of the Spirit. What we're looking at is the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Now, and, and one of the things you should do is don't exclude the body from your considerations. You're part of a body. You are an individual, and you've got to stand, stand before God as an individual. But you're also part of a body, and you can look around and see how the body's doing. And I'm in a very privileged position as your pastor and as someone who is in the church office. I see going by all the ways that you love one another. It's really amazing how much you love one another. And the love that the body shows for, for the people who are hurting, people who need meals, people who need a, a, a truck unloaded, the people who need uh, hospitality, all those things. If You might see in your neighborhood a little bit of that here, in, you know, a little skirmish. But in the church office, we see it just, it's like being at the intersection of major, uh, two major highways. The, or to change the metaphor, it's like, being able to watch the circulatory system of blood pumping through the body. Love circulating through the body, is the, that's the circulatory system. That's, that's why the body is healthy, if love is circulating. And as your pastor, I can tell you that an awful, that an awful lot of you lay yourselves out for other people. And well done. All right, well done. At the same time, don't say, okay, we've arrived, and then try and sit on the Sit in the pile. Paul says to the Thessalonians, you love all the brothers throughout Macedonia, and he urges you, and he urges them, therefore, to do so more and more. Your love is renowned. He says, your love is renowned. And they say, and the Thessalonians say, thank you, thank you very much. And he says, now I want to see some more. He, uh, God is pleased with you, but not satisfied. 
God is like a, a, an adoring parent, pleased with his child, but not satisfied. You wouldn't, if you're ple- you know, your two-year-old accomplishes something, you know, something he's never done before, you're enormously ple- pleased, perhaps even more pleased than you ought to be. <laughs> not that remarkable. Lots of kids have done this before. <laughs> but you are enormously pleased. You would not be satisfied if that's where they stopped. You'd be dismayed. You'd, get, you'd seek out experts. You'd go to doctors. If that's where they stopped, you'd say, oh, there's a developmental problem. God looks at his church. He is pleased with you, but not satisfied. And the reason there's budgeted room for him to be pleased and not satisfied and you not be destroyed because he's not satisfied, the reason for that is the justification that we enjoy because the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imputed to all of us. So, you looked for fruit. You look for the fruit of the Spirit. You don't look for gifts. You don't look for remarkable external events. We rejoice when they happen. We glorify God when they happen. But that's not what it's based on. We want to look in the mirror of the Word and see what it looks like when a congregation of saints is loving one another. We want to see how open-handed they are. We want to see how generous they are. We want to see how much they give each other to one another. We want to see their humility. We want to see all those things. And then when we hold that up and we say, and how does that relate to how I'm doing? The answer is not automatically, oh, I'm doing great because I'm me. The answer is going to be an accurate portrayal. You're going to see yourself accurately. And, the, and, and looking in the mirror of the word is the only way you're going to see yourself accurately. And so as we learn to look to Christ as a body of believers, we will be enabled by the Spirit to see the results of it. Holding it up to the lessons gleaned from our brothers and sisters in the first century. I am convinced that unless we understand how the Holy Spirit of God worked in our brothers and sisters of the first century, we will not know how we're supposed to act in the 21st century. And if we are living the way they did, we are going to be making all the necessary adjustments for the differences in cultural terrain. There are many, many differences, but there are also some astounding similarities. We are going to see, we're going, we are going to see remarkable faithfulness. We're going to see Christians who flake. We're going to see people who stumble. We're going to see faithful Christians who wobble. We're going to see faithful Christians who don't wobble. We're going to see people who are apparently not Christians at all because this is the book God gave us. This is how we're supposed to read it. And so, looking to Christ is not this, this magic thing you do, okay, I told myself I'd look to Christ. No, you look to Christ, crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended, and you do, do this together with your brothers and sisters, and then you look for opportunities to display the fruit of that. And the, you're not justified by your sanctification, you're not justified by your fruit, But your fruit tells you about your justification. Faith justifies you. Your works justify the genuineness of that faith. Our Father and gracious God, we are grateful to you for your goodness. We thank you for all that you've given to us. We thank you for this book. I pray that we would profit from it the way your spirit wants us to profit from it. And Father, we commit all of this to you. We lift up our prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying... Any outside observer of the Lord's Supper can see that it is more than a meal. Such an observer gets the sense that participation at this table comes with certain obligations. All meals carry some obligations with them. If you eat at another's table, you understand that there are certain duties, even if they are simply showing up on time, saying thank you, and being a polite dinner guest. But this outside observer would quickly get the idea that more will be required of him at this table than simply saying thank you, and he would be right. While it is by grace and grace alone that we come to this table, it does not follow that we can come and go disregarding the commands of the Lord of the table. The one who says, this is my body broken for you, also says, take up your cross and follow me. So while none of us are Jesus, and it's important that we keep that point clear, every Christian must be like him. It would be foolish for us to think that we are bread like Christ is bread and that we will not be broken as he was broken. 
It would be silly for us to think that we will proclaim the Lord's death here at this table and not follow him to Calvary. Christ suffered for our welfare. And Paul picks up this theme saying that death was at work in him while life and those to whom he ministered. So it must be with us. As you come to the one who sought your good, seek one another's good. As you come to the one who interceded for you, intercede for one another. As you come to the one who protects and defends you, protect and defend one another. Bread is made to be broken, and you are bread. And when bread is broken, it can nourish others. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Our Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your Son for our sins. In gratitude, we come to this table, and we also come resolving to sacrifice for one another. We pray that you would bless us in that endeavor, for we come in the name of Jesus, and amen. The charge is this. A number of years ago, there was a movement in, in uh, the church called the Young, Restless, and Reformed uh, Movement, and that coalesced in part in a network of churches called the Acts 29 uh, network. And since that time, the Acts 29 uh, group has sort of lost their way in the woke swamp or the soft woke swamp, which is a sad story. But at the beginning, it was brilliantly named. Uh, Acts 29 is, is what the church era is. We are the continuation of what happened in the first century. Acts 29 is it. And, but you can't protect it just by naming it brilliantly, Acts 29, because there were scoundrels and flakes and people who didn't do it right in the book of Acts. In the first century church, there were people who were faithful, people who weren't, people who oscillated. There's all, all of that is part of what we need to learn and take to heart. We don't have any automatic guarantees. We just see, need to keep our eye on Christ, our eye on the text, and our eye on our own hearts. So with believing hearts, receive the benediction of your God. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen.